Uh, <clears throat> let's begin. So, yeah, great to see all of you here. Um, I will give you a quick update what happened in the last 12 months uh, on the core framework, which is Eclipse Smart Home, and with uh, what we've learned from, the, from Benjamin's talk with 100 plus committers, yeah, one of the one of the bigger projects in Eclipse IoT. Um, short introduction, my name is Henning Troy. I'm a, actually a full-time Eclipse Smart Home committer, so it's my day job and it's possible because of all of you guys, so a big uh, thanks up front. And most uh, probably you will find me on GitHub commenting your code, reviewing your code, um, and sometimes also implementing core stuff by myself. And if you want to contact me, just do it on the Twitter. Okay, let's uh, dive into it. So um, first thing I just wanted to quickly mention is that we upgraded the license to uh, EPL 2.0 by the end of 2017, I guess. So Eclipse Smart Home is completely licensed under the new Eclipse public license. Okay, so forget everything you read on this slide, please, because I just want to mention it briefly, because David will give you a, a very deep and nice talk about the MQTT support, which finally landed. So we have native MQTT support in Eclipse Smart Home. Also, the second thing I want to mention only briefly, because Yannick will give us a, a, a detailed overview about semantic metadata and the ontology, which is now defined in Eclipse Smart Home, which is a very, very interesting topic. Okay, so I want to start actually with um, an update on new bindings. Um, we have some new bindings which are directly in Eclipse Smart Home, uh, available in Eclipse Smart Home. First one is Bosa SoundTouch. Then uh, we have OneWire, which is an yeah, actually completely new binding. And if you are on Eclipse Smart Home and OpenHub 2, you can now have native support for OneWire. Then uh, the Homatic binding is actually not that new. I just wanted to mention that it moved from OpenHub to Eclipse Smart Home, and now also has some yeah, commercial support, I would say. Well, not support, but it's commercially developed um, in the Eclipse Smart Home space. And the last one I want to mention is the generic Bluetooth low energy support. So we have a very generic binding which covers Bluetooth LE. And I will give you some more details about that. So the, the very basic generic Bluetooth LE binding will just list you devices in paired mode or in beacon mode and will give you the identifier and the signal strength. But it's only the, the basis for the Bluetooth support because it can and should be extended by a specific device support. So the binding will be extended by further OSGI bundles, and I've listed three of them, which are part of Eclipse Smart Home, which is one for the Blue Giga USB dongles. So it's a bundle providing a Bluetooth LE bridge. The same for the Blue Z support, which provides a bundle for the Blue Z stack, which is available on Linux. And uh, the last one is the blue key beacon support, which are small sensor beacons for temperature, humidity, and um, rotation sensor and stuff like that. And if you happen to want to uh, develop a binding for the Mac OS Bluetooth chip, you are very, very welcome to do that because it's unsupported. Okay. Uh, next thing is authentication. Um, we have now an open authentication client available directly in Eclipse Smart Home, and it supports various OAuth flows. I don't want to get into details here, but 
yeah, all the usual suspects are yeah, um, available. Next is the HTTP authentication and authorization. And um, this will bring you a very pluggable and configurable handler chain, which um, also are where in a basic implementation for HTTP basic authentication is available, but it's really, really extendable and pluggable, so you can build your own solution on that one. Next, we have a common HTTP and WebSocket client. The, the cause of that was that the, the Jetty HTTP client and WebSocket client we are using in Eclipse Smart Home was using or is using a lot of threads, a lot. One single WebSocket client, I guess, is about 30 threads for this one client, for your one connection. So if you have multiple bindings using WebSocket clients, this will sum up really quickly. And as you know, we are running on restricted gateways, so that's a huge problem. And with this um, common HTTP and WebSocket client, we can reduce this thread count a lot, give the stuff um, an own thread pool, and yeah, possibly get away with it and don't have those problems anymore. Next big thing which arrived in the last year was the units of measurement support. Um, a few words about uni units of measurement is, yeah, most of the stuff we are sensing in the smart home is temperature, humidity, so these are the usual suspects, but also energy flow, stuff like that. And all of those values come with units, so typically, in Europe, you will have centigrade or degree Celsius. You will have meter, kilometer, stuff like that. So we are in the metric system. If you are in the US, so you, the people usually don't know what centigrade is or how 20 degrees centigrade feel for them. They are used to have 68 degree Fahrenheit. And with units of measurement built into the system, it doesn't matter what um, value with a unit your sensor provides. You can just define your items to yeah, be Fahrenheit items or yeah, any unit you want items, and you will have built-in unit confer um, conversion right into the system. There's also a local-based default unit, so if you don't provide any information about units, it will just look up the default unit for your locale, which is hopefully uh, in your settings, and will provide you with the conversion out of the box. And of course, it's full support for DSL scripts. I will show them later, so basically in the DSL or in the scripts, you can calculate new values even new units. I have to get my drink. Okay. So this is uh, how the basic flow looks. You have the binding on the very left, measuring 20 whatever degree um, Celsius, and it will hand over this value with the unit Celsius to the framework because the framework then can do unit conversion as it provides this value to the item. Um, do you see the pointer? No? Okay, but you can see that on the item we have a state description which tells us that we want one decimal place and the unit a degree Fahrenheit. So the framework automatically knows to convert the Celsius value to the Fahrenheit value. And it will also, because the, the, the item state is now um, a quantity type with exactly this value and uh, this uh, unit, it will also pass it on to the rules like this. So the former 20 
point whatever degree Celsius don't play any role anymore. So the framework converted it. And then uh, if you want to have just another unit in your sitemap presented to the user, you can just use the same definition style. And my um, example here is with the conversion to Kelvin, which is the base unit for temperature. Typically, you don't want to present your children, your other uh, guys in the family, the temperature in Kelvin, but who knows? So maybe all of them are uh, experts in the field of <laughs> what, yeah, whatever. So you can use the same notation and um, have the value automatically converted on the way to the sitemap, on the widget. So this is with statically defined units on items or on widgets. This one is about the locale-based conversion, which I mentioned earlier. Here I have the, quite the, the same example as on the um, last slide, but we have a locale defined, which is English in the US, and now the state descri description looks a little bit different, and typically the state description with this special um, placeholder with this special unit placeholder will be defined on the channel type, so you don't have to put it on the item. On the, on the item state description, you are free to move this unit placeholder to any place you like, so you, it does not have to be the last, the last thing in the, in the state description, but typically it will just come from the, from the um, channel type. And since we are now have a locale of US, the system will automatically know to convert the centigrade value to into Fahrenheit. And the same with a sitemap, so you can use the unit placeholder anywhere in the state description of the widget for the sitemap. And this will even work for doing controls from the sitemap. So you can, uh, as you know, define switches, and you can define switches even with, uh, with a map with many states. And then uh, you have the opportunity to define a specific unit for every single option value, which can be, yeah, on the on the basic UI, selected by a push of a button. So you can have centigrade, Fahrenheit, Kelvin, all in the same place, and it will be converted on the way backwards and presented to the binding in, yeah, basically as a quantity type. And the binding has to make sure it fits the unit of the, of the physical channel. This is the same example as before, but now we are in, Fran in France, so locale is um, French. And here you can see that basically no conversion at all will take place because yeah, locally based, we are in the metric system, we get centigrade provided from the binding so nothing to do here, just uh, cut the decimal places. When did I start? <laughs> okay, here are some examples on uh, how to use the units of measurement support in the DSL. Um, we had to define a special separator between the scalar value and the unit so that the parser wouldn't break. The first, I guess the first try was to do it without, and it looked really, really nice, but it didn't work. So, yeah, um, you have to ha have this pipe symbol to separate um, the scalar value from the unit. Uh, as you can see, in the second line, you can just call to unit with yeah, any unit you can imagine and uh, have it converted that way. Um, the third example is about calculating yeah, somehow new units, as you can see, so the velocity in the, in the first line will then be 100 kilometers per hour. It will be notified as such and also printed out as such. And the same with acceleration. And the third thing is just to show you that there are um, other notations too, so you can um, 
use various notations to create a new quantity type in your rules and obviously compare them with equality, less, greater than, and yeah, stuff like that. Works pretty good. And a lot of bindings now come with units of measurement support, so all the user-facing features, like defining um, state description on the item or for the sitemap, can be used for a lot of bindings now. Then a few updates um, about coding style. So if you happen to develop a binding or develop core framework stuff, um, this one is for you. We are switching to a builder pattern for most of the core model parts. So um, yeah, I, I listed a few. We have channel type builder and channel builder, channel definition builder, bridge builder, because it will allow us to extend the API without breaking the old API, so the, the former way was to just extend the constructor by the 14th, 15th parameter, and you couldn't tell what you are creating there. And with the builder pattern, it's much more readable, better extendable, as I said. And uh, for bindings, we have the thing handler exposing the thing builder with edit thing. And we have the thing handler callback exposing the same for channels, channel groups. Yeah, that's basically it. Or for edit channel, you get a pre configured channel builder with the channel you want to edit. Um, second, yeah, coding style stuff is that we get or got rid of Groovy about 99.9% because .9 there's only one class left which has a Groovy dependency, but all other tests where we did use Groovy are now converted to Java. And um, yeah, so the new recommendation is to use Java test or Java OSGI test as a base class and implement um, your unit tests in pure Java. And for um, Java 11 support, we are I guess about also 99% there, because um, all the stuff is actually Java 11 compatible. There's only one library which uses illegal access to some, uh, some core Java classes, so illegal reflective access, which is a warning in Java 9, uh, 10 and 11, but yeah. We can't do much about it right now. Uh, last slide, to give you an outlook, we are working on a separation of the thing handler and a device configuration. There's a huge discussion spreading about a few um, issues on the, on the GitHub tracker, but um, yeah, the first thing will be to have a config description for the thing handler and one config description for the device itself, which we need for a few bindings, actually. Then um, we want to introduce start levels, which can, can be yeah, configured by the solution. So you, can de or you should define which start level is available for the OSGI services, which is start up, so you will have a, yeah, a static way and know when your rules will start to fire and stuff like that. So that's a, a long and ongoing problem in the, in the framework right now. And last but not least, we plan to uh, exchange the, the scheduler for a more stable implementation. It is actually quite stable, but there are some edge cases in the Astro binding where um, the scheduler does not behave that nicely. Last thing, you guys rock. My job is only there because you provide so many code, and yeah, that's just great. Thanks.